Well, what should we do? Our world is changing. I'm doing something I never thought I'd ever do. I'm preaching to an empty church so that our church members can see this at home. I don't know about your world, but my world's really changed. I've been a Lakers fan all my life. There's no longer NBA season. I enjoyed watching March Madness. I always picked out who was going to be the champion, but I never had it right. My wife goes to start Target on Saturdays. I used to go with her and sit in Starbucks. Can't do that anymore either. My wife works at school. School's closed. People are crazy about toilet paper and paper towels. The shelves are empty. There's no services, no worship. Church is closing. Canceled the Diggles family concert. What am I doing? Well, I'm reading a book by Bill O'Reilly about killing Kennedy. And I'm studying the book of Genesis with Bob Russell on CDs. And taking long walks. But what does Jesus want us to do at this time? With that answer, I turn to Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus doesn't just give us the negative, he gives us the positive. This is always the way true Christianity works. It doesn't just tell us to put off, it also tells us to put on. It doesn't just t tell us to say no, it always gives us a bigger and better yes. And so in the light of this background, Jesus gives us two commands. The first thing we're told to do is do not be anxious. The second thing we're told to do is seek first the kingdom of God. Do not be anxious, seek first the kingdom. So let's consider both of these together. First, Jesus says, do not be anxious. Just in case you were dozing off when he said it the first time, or got distracted when he said it the second time, he says it three times in this passage I just read. Do not be anxious. Did you catch the word that comes right before each time he says it? Verse 25 begins with, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. Verse 31 begins with, therefore, do not be anxious. Verse 34 begins with, therefore, do not be anxious. Now you see what this means? It means the Christian's peace is always meant to be a rational peace. It means we don't have to somehow dig deep and muster it all up ourselves. It means that we're meant to know something that logically and spiritually removes anxiety. Now I understand that there are cases when anxiety is in fact a chemical issue that only medicine can remedy. But remember as Christians, we always have a therefore What's the there for? What's the reason for our peace? It's the truth that in Christ, God is our loving Heavenly Father. 
That is what chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's all about the Father. Starting at the very beginning, Jesus tells us of the Father who sees. And then when he comes to prayer, we're told of the Father who knows and who hears. Now here, we're told that God is our Father who cares and who provides. What is our therefore? The logical background for our peace that God sees, he hears, he knows, he cares, and he supplies. What does Peter say in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7? It reads, cast all your anxieties upon him, for here's the reason. He cares for you. This is the background to our life, the sovereignty care of our Heavenly Father. But the problem that Jesus points out in verse 25 is that too often we're only focused on the foreground. We're focused on the wrong things, asking the wrong questions. What we're focused on is our immediate needs, and all we're asking is, what if? What if I don't get? What if this happens? What if my needs? So what does Jesus do? Starting in verse 26, he begins the background in view. He says, look at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. <clears throat> Who feeds them? Who dresses them? It's God. God is managing the entire bird economy. And God is in the control of the little fashion industry. What is he doing? He's getting us to see the background. It's almost like he's saying, imagine a father who has a bunch of birds for pets, and these birds don't work, they don't toil, they're not stressed out, and yet they're fed every day. How irrational would that father have to be to care more for the birds in a cage than for his own children in his house? And this same father has a garden of flowers. How mad would that father have to be to care more about the flowers than his very own children? And this is why Jesus says, are you not of more value than they are? And the answer is, of course you are. God is your father and you're his children. And every father in his right mind knows how much he cares for his children. What is Jesus doing? He's getting us to see the background, that behind every good thing in all creation is the loving, sustaining hand of our Heavenly Father. Never mind his very own children. This is the background that Jesus wants us to remember and to be reawakened with. Because if we don't, and if we're not, that's all the no long-term solution for our anxiety. So at this time of what we're going through, you may ask, where, where, where is God? I understand that deeply. I sympathize with that question. Well, let me ask you, where was Jesus? Remember, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So where was Jesus? In John chapter 2, we find him in Cana making wine at a wedding. But then in John 11, we find him in Bethany crying his tears out over a funeral. Where is Jesus? He's at the wedding. He's at the funeral. And if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. So where is God? He's at the wedding. He's at the funeral. God is there on our good days and our bad days because he's the God of Good Friday and the God of Easter Sunday morning. He's the God of the spectacular and the God of the ordinary and main day. He's the God of the hills and the God of the valleys. He's a God in the midst of our laughter and the midst of our tears. He's a God when the market is up and God when the market is down. He's a God in the light and he's God in the dark. Where is God? God is with us. He is both places. He's in all places. He's carefully sovereignty in control of it all. He's our ever-present help in time of need. That's the background. So the problem isn't with God. The problem is with us. The problem, Jesus says, is that we forget the true background of life. As the old hymn goes, this is our Father's world. Let us never forget that though the wrong seem so strong, God is still the ruler. Sin blinds us 
from the background of God's goodliness in life. But thankfully, Jesus can open the eyes of the blind. This is the background that Jesus is calling our hearts to see, it's the eyes of faith. So anxiety comes from obsessing over the wrong things, our immediate issues and asking the wrong question. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? That's the question that breeds anxiety and worry and fear because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. Only God does. The question that brings peace and hope and strength is, who is? Who is my God? Who is our God? What do we profess to believe as Christians? I believe in God the Father Almighty. That's it. That's the background of our life and our faith. So what are you focused on? What questions are you churning over in your heart and mind? Do not be anxious. But then as I said, we're also giving something to do. We're given the positive. Seek first the kingdom. Now what does this mean? And how do we do it practically? But well, before we try and answer that, I want you to see the helpful connection that Jesus makes for us here. In verse 32, Jesus connects our anxiety with our seeking. Watch this, he says, the Gentiles, which was short in their day for the people who didn't know God. He says, they're the ones seeking after all of these things, like health and wealth and material possessions, the physical things of life. That's all they want. That's all they talk about. And that's why they're anxious about it. You see the principle? Our anxieties reveal our priorities. We get anxious about the things we put our hope in. That's why earlier in this chapter, Jesus says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. In other words, what you're hoping in, what you're investing in, that's what's going to have a vice grip on your heart. So what does Jesus do? Again, he calls the background into view and he says, let me give you something else to seek after. It's almost like he says, you want to be anxious for something? Be anxious for this. You want to seek something? Seek this. Seek first the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? Well, he already told us in verse 20, he says, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Invest in eternal things. Don't put your ultimate hope in this life. Put it in the next life. But how do we do that? Well, elsewhere, Jesus tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to go the extra mile, to turn the other cheek. So seeking first the kingdom of God involves two main things. Remembering our hope of heaven and radically demonstrating the love of Christ in the here and the now. You see how this works? The great security of our hope in heaven frees us to demonstrate the love of Christ in the here and the now. In case you're tempted to think, ah, that's just some pie in the sky, impossible, unrealized ideal. Let me remind you that the early Christians took those words to heart, lived them out and radically changed the world. Later in the first century, this is what we read in Hebrews chapter 10. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. What, what? You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that, had a better possession and an abiding one? You see the connection? The hope of heaven and the love of Christ. The spread of Christianity in the early centuries was largely due to the care and compassion that Christians showed for the poor and the sick during difficult plagues and epidemics. Have you come to that place? Can you say with the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you have the hope of heaven? What did Jesus say later in Matthew 10? Do not fear, but can destroy the body. Fear God who can destroy both the body and the soul. And he asked the calculating question, 
What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? One of the things that times like this call us back to the brevity and fragile of life and the great question of where do I stand with God? And it calls us to put other needs before our own. None of us know what that might mean for us in the coming months, but it sure doesn't look like hoarding toilet paper and hiding in the basement. It looks like Christ and a cross. It looks like running towards the need, not running from it. It looks like sharing our resources. It looks like the type of life that only makes sense if heaven is real, if Christ is alive, and if his love and our driving force is life. Now we're going to do this perfectly. Are we going to do it perfectly? Of course not. But thankfully, we know the one who has. From Bethlehem to Calvary, Jesus always lived with the background in view. Every day of his life, he had a serene attitude of peace and sacrificial actions of love. Even there on the cross, we see him loving his enemies and saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The very thing that God requires of us, Jesus has already fulfilled for us. For all those who put their faith in him, we're not saved by our peace and love, we're saved by his. So if you put your faith in Christ, then the pressure to respond to these times is a perfect way is because Christ has already done it for you. But at the same time, remember that the power and the possibilities do not be anxious and seek first the kingdom is very much available. Because what does Jesus say before his departure? My peace I give you, my spirit I give you. Friends, in this fragile, crazy, fallen world, as people who call themselves Christians, we're called to bear witness to the kingdom of Christ. My friend, be strong. Let's take this one day at a time. Again, let's feed our faith so our fears will starve. If you feed your fears, your faith will starve. This is a time for faith. This is a time for trust. This is a time for hope. Thank you and God bless you.